Welcome everybody to Monday Night Live. I've got uh, Justin Urquhart Stewart with me today. This is the fourth time Justin's appeared uh, on our show and Justin, we're absolutely delighted to have you back. Justin, before I ask you about the economy and Brexit and all sorts of things that are going on, did I read your column in the, um, oh, I can't show that properly, can I? Can I read your column right in the uh, Daily Mail on Saturday? You're recommending <laughs> cannabis. Uh, it's true. Well, it wasn't actually recommending that you actually go and buy cannabis, but there are cannabis companies or companies that benefit uh, from the sale of cannabis, medicinal or otherwise. Um, so it hasn't quite reached the stage. I'm sorry, the Monday night cat has appeared. Um, uh, but uh, it's interesting to see actually just how profitable some of these businesses are. But here's a fashion fad of ever there was. Someone's going to be ripping somebody else off for, for that. Sorry, I should now remove the cat. Is that cat on cannabis, by the way? It, it's stoned, this cat. Okay, stoned. that's all right then. That's all right. Now, the second thing is I want to congratulate you. I hear you just got engaged. So uh, everybody, please, in the usual way, a round of applause <laughs> for, for Justin. Thank you very much. You're very kind. It hasn't actually gone public yet, so you're the first to know. Well, apart well it will be now. Yeah. It will be uh, all, over, all <laughs> over the internet and all over everything. So uh, you can trust all my uh, viewers So for that. OK, let's get stuck into right. the matters of uh, why, why everybody's here. Tell us what's been going on in the markets over the last uh, three or four months since we saw you. Why are interest rates going up? They're going up pretty quickly if I look at the 10-year bond yield. And... Um, What's going to happen in the uh, in the budget, but also for our American uh, listeners, what's happening uh, over there as well? Ooh, where to start? Right. Well, let's first of all, let's go back to uh, the, the baseline of all of this, which is the global economy. Um, and despite what are the headlines keep on screaming at us the entire time, because they love nice, frightening headlines. The global economy is growing again. Uh, and that is an encouraging sign, considering actually what happened last year, which wasn't just an economic difficulty, a horrendous pandemic, appalling levels of death, uh, and also, of course, the impact that has on families. And then also, it's the, the effect that was on the economy, creating a series of financial heart attacks around the country, around the globe, and then watching various com company, countries be able to manage them effectively or otherwise. Um, and of course, we're still not out of this. Nobody's really actually come out the other side yet, with the exception of China, but of course, they can control that. Uh, in all sorts of ways, you don't necessarily need to go in now, to now. Um, but it does, at least now, with uh, certainly with spring coming, there is a more positive step amongst there are a level of frustration about lockdown, but we've now got vaccines that are working, and they're rolling out successfully in the UK. Let's see if we can do something right. Um, and uh, so that's given us, I think, a much better background uh, to what's happening. Now for a dose of reality. All these nations around the world have uh, rung up huge levels of debt, um, and so now they've got to try and manage it. They can't, man, they can't repay all the debt. They won't repay all the debt. This is not like running the household budget. Running governments can run deficits for well forever if they so wish. What they need to make sure is they create the level of confidence that for people buying you know, government bonds and anything related to it, that the countries themselves, the government, the countries aren't actually going to go bust. And actually, the United Kingdom is one of the very few countries that has never actually found itself in the position of actually having to renege on any of its debts. Um, most of them have at some stage in their murky past. But what has been useful for all the capitalist nations, uh, for those who actually have their own reserve currencies, um, uh, it meant, of course, we have the joys of quantitative easing, which is uh, not a confidence trick, but it is a trick of confidence. Because what you're asking, in effect, is people to uh, believe that, that, that the government can actually finance itself by producing its own debt and then buying it itself. So the largest owner of, uh, uh, of a British debt is, of course, the British government. And now over £20 billion of interest payments, well, actually, uh, uh, you know, coupon payments uh, on the debt is paid by the government to the government. You couldn't make it up, really, could you? Um, so uh, and we can carry on like that for some time. Uh, until someone turns around and says, actually, the emperor might be somewhat sartorially challenged, but no one's going to say that for the time being. But it has meant that you haven't got that terrible precipice where you think that we you know the whole thing's now going to collapse. They can keep on a level of quantitative easing so long as it's still being credible. Not just Britain. Japan's taken it to a whole new level. The Japanese government and uh, controls the Japanese bond market and they'd be buying directly in corporate, uh, corporate equities in Japan and even uh, property. So the government has really made it into a state-controlled economy. It's really quite remarkable. So Justin, it's going to be interesting. So that, that background is, is positive. 
Fantastic. I was just going to ask you about interest rates. So I see the bond yield um, went up by half a percent or one percent. That costs the UK government a lot of interest on quantitative easing, doesn't it? Or does it? Because I'm confused. Well, uh, well, it's it's interesting to see because what they've done is refinance all their debt. Uh, so they've actually reduced that cost very significantly. But you're quite right. Um, if you've got, particularly if you've got variable uh, debt, which can adjust with interest rates, then the cost of that debt will go up indeed. And to give you the concept of the, or sort of, a, a sort of a, the, an idea of what the debt is like, um, well, in terms of interest payments now, uh, it's just over 55 billion sterling a year. Uh, and to put that in perspective, that's more than the defence budget for the United Kingdom, which is about 48 billion. And what so about uh, any rise of rates there will have a dramatic impact. And so it was interesting last week, we did have this sort of bond riot, bond rout, um, as the general view was interest rates are going up. But Ah, we have a slight hiccup there because it looks like uh, somebody's um, axed Justin's, um, Justin's broadband by the look of it. He's frozen at the moment. So um, it's over to the emergency uh, broadcast from uh, from me. I was very interested in the fact that... Um, ludicrously low rates, um, because Justin, that you, is um, the same. Justin, you froze there for about 10, 10 seconds. So... Um, we, Sorry, it was just merely to say that uh, uh, what you'll go find is that the government can carry on with this and be able to finance itself whilst it's still got that credibility. So our budget statement for Mr. Sunak later this week will be all about that vital word of confidence. Uh, he's, he can't wage a magic wand and get rid of the debt. Or of course, actually, a lot of these governments can waive an awful lot of it, because remember, they own the debt and they own the asset. So they can actually, in the good old strength of double-sided uh, you know, double bookkeeping, cross each other side off, but they've got to be careful how they do that overall. So the main way to get out of this for all economies is going to be to try and grow their way out of it. Um, and uh, so that does need, need a level of synchronicity. Um, and we're likely to get that much more with the, with the Biden uh, regime in America. And obviously, interesting to see what's happening in Europe, because they still can't make up their minds precisely which way they're going. And the fundamental flaws of the euro are still there. Uh, but uh, you'll go around, uh, whether it's Japan, whether it's China, whether it's America, We've seen economies starting to improve again, uh, and that's positive for the global economy and positive for us. And sterling's rising against the dollar. Is that the Joe Biden effect? Uh, well, you know, sterling's rising, but also the dollar has been weakening, which is, uh, I think, probably a greater effort uh, uh, issue. Um, I was writing at the turn of the year when we, if we were going to get a Brexit deal, of course, we didn't know whether we were going to get a deal or not until the right the last moment. If we were going to get a Brexit deal, uh, then you'd actually find in the position, oh, okay. heavens, how the cats have gone walk, walkies. You actually find yourself in the position that sterling would then rise probably to about 140 against the dollar, which is roughly where it's gone uh, overall. Uh, so bear in mind, but the sterling is relatively uh, uh, unimportant compared to the big currencies, the dollar and the euro and the yen, um, but we're still a reserve currency. Uh, so it's much more that the dollar's weakened rather than necessarily sterling has strengthened because everyone's got more confidence in the UK economy. Uh, they haven't at the moment. And then you mentioned Europe, didn't you? Let's talk about Europe. Only only four percent of people vaccinated in France, six percent in Germany. They're going pretty crazy about that. We've nearly got thirty percent. Are we going to be able to take advantage of that, or are the uh, or will the issues around Brexit and the financial institutions hold us back? Uh, it's interesting. The level of uh, percentage of anti-vaxxers in places like France are really incredibly high. Um, you would have thought in this day and age we'd have gone way beyond that. Um, but uh, no, it's, uh, so it's going to be very difficult. And if ever there was uh, a reason for saying actually Europe can't get its act together, well, here's a classic example. Uh, the bureaucracy of Brussels coordinating all those nations together to try and make an efficient rollout. Uh, well, and frankly, it hasn't. It's been highly inefficient. Um, and remarkable, I saw a, uh, a headline in one of the German newspapers built actually saying, we are envious of the British for once. Um, and uh, on the basis of actually this has come up. Well, what effect does it have? Well, it gives us the opportunity to actually hopefully come out of lockdown in a better position. It gives us more confidence that actually uh, we can uh, open up faster. Um, and the question is now, uh, how does the Chancellor manage this coming out? There will be a sort of short-term sort of V-shaped uh, initial recovery. That's called you know, merely relief because we've been locked down for so long. We're all going to need to go out and have a decent drink together. Um, 
it's what happens after that V that's important. That only last a month or so. Can you get sustained growth thereafter? And that's where certainly I've been pushing for the chancellor here to focus on the areas that Britain's really rather good at. Now, unfortunately, the agreement with, uh, with over Brexit didn't include the financial services industry at all. It seemed to focus on the fishing industry. Now, we all love the fishing industry, except for the fact it's worth absolutely sod all. Um, uh, whereas actually the largest income provider for the British government is the financial services industry. And so the fact it wasn't mentioned in the agreement at all, um, you could say, well, maybe they're going to sort it out later. Or frankly, it was the prime minister just getting fed up with the city yet again. Um, but that's going to cause us uh, problems in the, in the long term. Uh, and that, that do does worry me. What I want to see, though, Britain, people say we don't make anything anymore, but we're still the world's eighth largest manufacturer. We make quite a lot of stuff. Um, however, what we are really good at, and this is the bit that tends to get ignored, is technology. And OK, we can say it's, uh, you know, it's uh, the next stop after uh, Silicon Valley. But actually, what you found is a lot of really good uh, track record of good uh, high tech startups in these sort of hubs and using the sort of same terminology of Silicon Valley. We've got Silicon Roundabout, Silicon Beach, which is Brighton, Silicon Fen, Silicon Glen, Silicon Gorge, which is Bristol. But what it basically means is you get these little hubs and they start breeding. Uh, it's like sort of looking, look, watching uh, you know, the amoeba under a microscope, suddenly more and more keep on coming out. So what the government can do is not give them money. That's not the issue. Government opiates aren't needed here. What you do need is actually proper tax incentives, create the right regime so that capital gains tax should be dealt with. Not put it up. What you should do is actually say there will be no capital gains tax if you're investing for 10 years plus. You know, making sure the real incentive for good longer term investing, um, not short term punting. Uh, so I hope we're going to be seeing more focus on that on technology, maybe creating some tax free areas. A certain talk about free ports uh, was one uh, element. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see. But the, the key issue here, though, is any chance, any uh, of the chances around the world have got the same issue. How do you not just get the economy to recover? How do you make it sustain that recovery? Uh, and that's going to be quite a trick at a, where the global economy is better, but still weak. OK, now um, I like to uh, pin you down. So what's the chance we're going to do in two days time? And if you get it wrong, you'll have to come back and talk to us again. <laughs> right. So almost certainly I look forward to seeing you on very soon then. Um, no, what we're going to be seeing here, there's not going to, it's not going to be a taxing uh, uh, budget. Although perversely, if you actually did want to put up taxes, this is the one time you'd probably get away with it because everyone realizes just how bad the debt situation is. Now, was, is there some room for some imagination to say to the ultra high net worth people, uh, actually your tax rates will go up, but I'll tell you what you do, uh, we'll keep it in statute only for five years so no one else can actually undo it. And we'll as they give you as a quid pro quo, X percentage off your inheritance tax or whatever it happens to be, something as a, a reward for that. They won't do that because that requires a level of imagination you're going to get. What we will see, though, uh, is much more focus on as much job creation as possible, because the next three months is going to be really awful for many people. The furlough scheme comes to an end and those people who've been having replacement salaries paid for by the government find themselves coming back. And there was a job. The job was protected. But now furloughs come to an end the job's gone. Um, and particularly you'll find that in, as we've seen in America, as you've seen elsewhere, um, obviously it's been the leisure industry which has been so badly hit. And so certainly with uh, some key hotels looking very empty indeed, like Mr. Trump's along with his golf courses as well, but that's uh, no bitchery for me. Um, but certainly though, it's, it's gonna be that sort of encouragement to encourage more investment, uh, longer term investing, uh, actually trying to make sure also more expenditure, as all governments do in terms of infrastructure, uh, they come up with big numbers, but it means very little because they're very, very long term plans. What I want to see, though, is some good initiatives on in regionally areas. So actually, you know, there's no shortage of money in the country. And uh, forgive me, this is an old era banged on about a lot. But here's a key chance of doing so is encouraging regional infrastructure funds. So let people in each region actually you know, invest in local infrastructure. They've got a better chance of getting that infrastructure built quicker rather than waiting for the central government to do anything about it. Same also with companies as well. So uh, Britain's got to go through, has the opportunity to go through some serious financial reform here. Whether this chancellor is the person to do it or not, I don't know. But on my wish list, 
um, it's going to be a, a a, some a really, I think, quite interesting reforms. The reality of it, though, I suspect is going to be quite dull in comparison. Uh, there'll be a lot of job protection, a job encouragement, all of which is motherhood and apple pie. Uh, but it's not going to be mucking around in a major way with uh, taxes. Bear in mind, there are only three main taxes in the United Kingdom. That is national insurance uh, and uh, income tax, which is effectively the same, really, and then VAT, value added tax. They account for more than 60% of the tax take. Even corporation tax is relatively small. Um, and so people get very worked up over uh, things like capital gains tax and all those sort of elements like inheritance tax. They're tiny in comparison. Those are the big ones you've actually got to try and do. So you need more expenditure in the economy. Um, you need more people working, more people working and paying tax. That's how you get the basis of the recovery coming through. Fantastic. Turning slightly to another subject now, as you talked about taxpayers, how do we stop people uh, living in Monte Carlo and not paying their taxes and yet uh, having all the perks of uh, being British? But also you and I have an interest in um, Maxwell and some of the frauds that he got up to this, uh, this lady in California, what's her name, Elizabeth Holmes, which uh, who, who stands for trial, I think next month, uh, the book's called Bad Blood, Patricia, Patisserie, Valerie, and all that. How do we stop that? And even Mr. Woodford, you know, starting a new oh. company with, uh, um, there's about 10 questions there, just put them into one and give me an answer. Okay. Um, in terms of an economy running itself uh, in a better, more, uh, more responsible way, things have changed. Those that, that terrible set of initials, ESG, uh, environmental, social, and governance, green issues, if you will. Um, you know, three or four years ago, they were nice to have. Unless, of course, you were in California, in which case, obviously, they're essential. Um, but they were so, almost slightly on the edge. You hear investors saying, here's my portfolio. That's what I want to do. Oh, I must do some green. Uh, get me a, a, green port, a green fund as well. That's changed. Now, this is actually center stage for most people in their investing, whether you're running a pension fund, uh, where we're already running your private uh, investment money. It's, it has to be seen to be sustainable with proper governance um, and obviously environmental as well. But what it means is, therefore, unless companies are going to be open now, how they're behaving, how they're operating, what they're doing, and making sure that is clearly shown to people, and I say that with some concern after what we saw with the, uh, the German firm last year with its uh, accounting issues, which were frankly a pack of lies. Um, and uh, so, again, we have to then press the accountancy to make sure that they can't just wash their hands of it. But ESG is going to be interesting. It's going to put companies in the position where they're going to have to be start telling the truth over things or be clearer or you'll find the likes of the large investors institutions we've seen this from legal in general we've heard it also from vanguard as well and blackrock um, that they will try and avoid investing in those uh, directly so we no longer have any oil companies we now have energy supply facilities <laughs> um, and they will all be saying we will be carbon neutral by a date where we won't be around by um, but that's what they're all now having to say so indirectly, therefore, does it mean that we're going to see a better quality of business that we can trust? Well, there are always going to be the Ponzi scheme uh, and uh, uh, those uh, financial records around. But the more open and controlled we can be about it, the better. And bear in mind, London's got a pretty bad reputation for this. You know, we were running a fantastic laundromat for the Russians for many years. Uh, and uh, so if you wanted to, do, you had where London would pride itself and say, look at all these amazing Central Asian uh, companies coming here from a stan or other um, and mining something which, I could, which you can't pronounce. Um, and would it float in America? No, because under the guidance they've got for most of their directors, they'd probably spend most of their time in Chokey. But London would accept them, and London did. And I'm afraid we did an awful lot of money laundering and we've done our reputation no good at all. And uh, so, uh, again, uh, London's got to work very hard to clean up its house in order to make sure it's still going to attract longer term money. OK, we've got a few Chelsea supporters on here, so be careful what you say, Justin, and I'll explain that <laughs> to the Americans later. Um, let's turn to financial uh, manipulation of markets. We've seen a bit of that recently, haven't we, which has, has made me cross Reddit. Um, shares going up that were virtually valueless, silver moving up, goodness knows what. 
And I'm not even sure whether Bitcoin was moving up or down or whatever. We've got one or but two investors in Bitcoin on here, but uh, I've told them they're crazy, but they don't agree with me. But it is a classic case at the moment. Uh, and we've got a lot of the SPADs or SPACs coming out, special, special purpose acquisition, acquisition of vehicles or companies, often with the expressed view in terms of their investment intentions to invest in uh, items which they see to be profitable i.e. they have no idea what they're going to be investing in. As an investor, you have no idea either. One of the phrases, which is not actually true, but was uh, assigned to the South Sea bubble back in the 1720s, uh, was actually that here is an enterprise, the details of which we're unable to tell you at the moment. And it went off uh, like a rocket and uh, came down like a stick. Um, and uh, so it's, I'm afraid we're seeing not dissimilar signs to some of that, that overhyping. The issue, though, of Game Store, though, and Reddit and things, I thought was fascinating because that shouldn't come as any surprise at all. That you've actually got social media now finding itself in a position where it can corral excitable punters, not real investors, but young punters, um, actually to, to force their way through to go and buy stock in something which you know full well that the institutions are betting against. So the power of the retail market, no one could ever really think that that was actually have that uh, ability to do that. But for small companies like that, in that position where there are people uh, who have been big short positions, well, there's hedge funds are laying themselves open to it. And there's only one technical term should be used for them, which is um, diddums. Um, what it now means they all have to do is cover their positions more effectively. And frankly, that's a good thing. Uh, the bad thing, of course, about that is I'm delighted that actually several American students I know paid off their student loans as a result of that, which is well done for them. The problem is, and you can always hear them already people chattering about it, other people trying to join in, this is something we can do all over the place. No, no, that's a recipe for losing money. And speak of which, you mentioned silver. For those of a certain age may remember, uh, and uh, Tim, I'm sure you'll know better than any of us in terms of the Bunker Hump family. Um, and uh, uh, fascinating that uh, you know, they tried to corner the market in the silver uh, and silver trade, and they effectively went bust as a result of it in a rather spectacular manner. Um, so be careful. There's some classic examples here of um, uh, overhyping and uh, incredible values which are not going to be sustainable. And I'm afraid you're going to find over the course of this year more of these issues coming out as people try and find bigger and better returns, sharper returns. No, good investment is slow and steady. If you're doing investment well, um, it should be actually quite dull um, because you're building your money in the long term in a secure manner. If you actually want to go punting, thoroughly enjoy punting. That's why we have horse racing in this country. Uh, and don't get that mixed up with your investing policies. That's interesting, is it? Because I always think there's only one winner with horse racing and uh, any gambling, and that's William Hill. And it's usually the person in the middle that supplies all the services that uh, that makes all the money. I just cannot understand why people uh, speculate, but uh, perhaps someone can put me right on that at uh, some reason, re at some point. I guess it's uh, I guess it's just greed. Um, can we talk politics for a minute? Can we talk politics yeah. in the UK? Boris, Sir Keir Starmer, uh, Germany, Mrs Merkel. I think she stands down, doesn't she? Everyone's yep. going to carry on for a bit. And uh, in America, Joe Biden and, uh, and Trump. I hear Trump's um, having a rally or had a rally yesterday. What's your view? Right. Well, first of all, if I do the uh, parochial domestic side of the, of the UK, um, We've got a government that's going to be here for a while. Um, uh, the opposition actually find themselves in a rather difficult position. Because what are you going to say? Uh, there's not a great deal to say the government's wrong in spending money. The government's wrong in trying to actually get us out of uh, the mess. Um, and so to a great extent, you know, they almost need to keep the trap shut for the time being and wait for Boris to, to muck it up, which he will do, because you know, he has the ability to put his foot in his mouth on an astounding number of occasions. So Sakir Starmer might not come over as the most exhilarating or exciting person at the moment. But he sort of hasn't got some great ammunition to work with at the moment. So for, he just has to actually just go with the flow for the time being, wait for the prime minister and the government to cock it up. There'll be lots of issues coming out over that. And then he can start doing something. Uh, so in terms of the United Kingdom, we still have two issues to try and deal with. One is the real interpretation of sorry, the effect of Brexit um, and how we're going to manage our way out of that. Um, we still haven't seen all the effects of that coming through. And of course, the question of the union as well, um, because up until two weeks ago, all the, uh, uh, all the polls were saying Scotland would be breaking away 
uh, wants to leave the union. And I have to say a lot of that was actually done to Boris. Um, it's not that, uh, that the Cranky's love child, uh, also known as Mrs. Sturgeon, um, is incredibly popular. She isn't. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately, it was Boris's uh, inability to actually come up with anything vaguely diplomatic um, that made life more difficult. But only last week, as a result of the scandal between a salmon and a sturgeon, okay, salmon isn't actually spelled that way, um, but uh, the scandal within the Scottish Nationalist Party um, has actually meant that there's now people thinking again and saying, actually, maybe the union possibly is a better position, particularly when they look at the debt, where they look at the amount of money that's being uh, spent in, uh, that Scotland gets in terms of extra support that they wouldn't, that they wouldn't be getting if they were breaking away. I'll be interested to see what happens there. Do you think, um, do you think being called Sir Keir Starmer and the leader of the Labour Party will give him an advantage or a disadvantage? It's that status thing. It's strange, isn't it? Also, you know, the very fact you have you know, a, a Labour leader coming from Surrey. You know, I mean, Surrey doesn't not well known for producing a long line of enthusiastic Marxists. Um, you know, it's the it's the uh, stockbroker commuter belt. Um, the only thing socialist he's got about him is his Christian name, Keir, after Keir Hardy. Um, but, uh, you know, so it's, it's interesting to see uh, that the fact he is a, 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 being made a knight, does it change the attitude towards uh, attract, not, not attracting the working vote? I don't think that's going to make much difference. What he's got to be able to show is, is uh, that actually Labour will have a policy, some strong policies to guide the economy over the, uh, over the next few years. But until we get out of this mess, he should probably keep his trap shut for the time being. Okay, let's go to let's go to Germany and France. France. I see the Macron's been put in, not Macron, um, the previous Sarkozy leader, put in jail. There's a good chance he'll probably go there, and uh, it's uh, no Macron's too dull to be put into jail. Um, but uh, no, the bit I worry about with Germany is um, now there we have Merkel stepping down, uh, and uh, Mutti Merkel, who has done an amazing job. Mm. Um, and uh, really has been a, you know, a, a, the powerhouse of Europe. There's only one problem, name one other German politician. And the answer is, we have no idea. It's been her the entire time. Um, so who takes over? And I think what you're now seeing is there is a level of resentment, which has always been in the EU towards, not the EU, but towards Brussels, towards the civil service of Brussels actually dominating things, running things. Unless you actually had strong politicians up against them, uh, then uh, they were having their own way. And Merkel was very good. That's why the Germans were so upset when we had the Brexit vote, because I remember talking to the, uh, the German finance minister, Scheibel, when asked the question, what happens if uh, Britain votes to leave? What are you going to do? He said, well, I'll burst into tears. And he said, well, not literally. But he said, what I mean by that is, we know that the EU is set up primarily as a, in a French manner. It's highly inefficient. It needs a reform. Germany wants to do that reform, but it needs you know, other political support to do it. And it can't do that with Denmark um, uh, or Liechtenstein. I'm afraid it's not actually that sort of, uh, you need people with some budget welly, some political welly to get things changed. So he's very frustrated. It meant they couldn't, weren't gonna get the reform process going through. So my concern with Europe is this. One, uh, it's gonna have weak leadership and where the clear view as to what the policy is going to be uh, and, and everyone buying into it, I'm not too sure we're seeing that at the moment. And you can see that when it look, and just having to look at the policies to try and get the economies going uh, together. The other element is the euro. The euro still has a fatal flaw in it. If you're running a single currency, a single currency means that actually uh, you have to maintain proper controls over you know, the levels of borrowing, uh, the way that actually the, the money is managed um, and the freedom of movement of money, all of those elements. Actually, within the euro, what you've got is every single country having different fiscal rules, different taxation systems. I know in America, all the states have different taxes, but it's harmonized, harmonized through the Fed to actually make sure it's got a single control over what's happening. Unless you get the EU nations being able to do that, the euro will have a fun, this fundamental flaw still within it. And it's gonna be very difficult for that, uh, to try and manage. So my view is still the euro will eventually fail unless they're able to address that. And I don't think they will. And I think in due course, and it may take 10 or 15 years, you'll see the currency split. You'll have the Euro, which is Northern European nations who realize that they actually do have to have a central fiscal control. And you have the zero, which will be the rest of them. And so the likes of Greece and those other countries, they'll still technically be in the Euro in terms of their overseas debt, 
but they'll effectively be operating with a domestic currency, the tradable olive or something like that, which will immediately devalue, but they'll be able to operate. So they'll still be within the EU, still within the ambit of, uh, uh, of uh, the currency, but not actually in the core part of it. Um, and so there's going to be some significant problems to the euro over the next few years, and that will impact on their economies as well. We've got to have a minute on uh, the US and then uh, we'll turn to uh, your new venture regionally and then we'll have a few questions. OK, well, the US, um, um, this is no way that I should be lecturing our American colleagues here on what's happening um, in terms of what should be happening. It's your country. Still, I'm delighted that you managed to get rid of the last guy just uh, although I see announced he's probably he's, uh, thinking about coming back another four years time. Oh dear. It's not so much him, it's some of his wretched family I can't stand, who appear to have a sort of God give a right, so they think, uh, to lord it over everybody, um, particularly with some of the lack of knowledge and, uh, uh, do I say intelligence? No, I better not say that. Um, but anyway, what you've actually got now is welcome back to Biden. It's the old school back again. Is that dull? Yes. Uh, Dull is actually quite good at the moment. Uh, does it mean that America is back, as Biden was saying, internationally? Yes, uh, with the Paris Accords, um, in terms of whether it gets into the Trans-Pacific Partnership or, and its uh, successor. It'll be interesting to see and what's going to be the policy with China. Um, and so I take a lot more comfort now with that uh, uh, Biden is there. The size of the package is eye-watering, whether it's right or not. Uh, it's, it's a question of scale. The American level of debt is just uh, astonishing. What they have to do, though, is get that economy moving on a sustainable basis. Um, so he's making all the right noises for that at the moment. Um, but American politics isn't looking particularly attractive at the moment with this very partisan world. But I'm not going to be throwing stones at them when I turn around and look at ours. They ain't much better. Yeah, I, I mean, when, when we had a rehearsal last week, I was just fascinated that our old firm Barclays um, before it sent you to Uganda, sent you to Wandsworth branch for your Ugandan training, where I think the only, <laughs> the only business there was um, was the biggest brewery in London, wasn't it? Uh, Young's yes, brewery. that was Young's Brewery, absolutely. That's a lovely idea. If we're going to the heart of Africa to training, you go to Wandsworth. If anyone knows London very well, they'll probably know what Wandsworth is like, and it's hardly the place you rush for for any training other than learning how to run very fast away from the mugger. Um, Actually, that would have been quite useful in Uganda, but no, well, I should have learned more on that one. Yeah, we'll, we'll go back to that one next time we have you on. Uh, how's regionally going? Because I think it's a fabulous idea and, uh, you know, to raise money locally. Yeah, and regionally is no more, frankly, than was there. Uh, the infrastructure was there 50 years ago. In the United Kingdom, there were, in 1945, 45 stock exchanges, most of which were highly inefficient, run by silly gits in red braces who were too greedy earning trading commissions. They forgot what a stock exchange is for. The primary purpose of a stock exchange is to raise capital for business in the most cost efficient and effective manner possible. On that basis, I would argue that London doesn't have a stock exchange anymore because the London Stock Exchange is more interested in data collection, which is very valuable and be very profitable. But not many people list on the London market anymore. Um, it serves large companies. Oh, there's AIM, the alternative investment market, which actually six of us started um, in Glasgow 35 years ago. And it was a low cost, simple, light touch uh, for small businesses to be able to raise capital. In that case, in Glasgow, it was a small gaming business, software gaming business. It was very successful. Now it's fat, overcharged, inefficient, and some of it, frankly, a bit corrupt in my view. Um, so one of the things I wanted to be able to do is not go back to the 45 stock exchanges, all of which got shut down. There is no shortage of money around the country, but everything is focused on London. Why can't you have people who say, I know that business around the corner here. Can I invest in that business? Well, no, there isn't a mechanism to do so. I can't exactly knock on the door and say, can I have give you a check? So actually we can create regional hubs so that companies growing, not just startups, not folks, there's lots of things for startups, but growing businesses, particularly at this moment after, after COVID, who need capital to get onto the next stage. And that growth area, that capital area, were from about half a million pounds to about 15 million pounds, really difficult to fund because business angels and individuals, it's too big for them, but it's too small for institutions. So if you could create regional, uh, effectively, stock exchanges, hubs, with their own list of companies, and you could have an index on that, you can then see how the Northeast, the Northwest is actually doing, and like any good index and a list of shares, if it's doing successful, it operates as a flag for the region and will pull in more money. 
So we started this and we've already just gone through the first three companies, which are now being properly funded. I haven't launched it yet because I only like to launch things once it's working and I've done a cycle that could show it's working. But we'll be doing that in the next month or so um, and being able to show to people, look, this is where your money is really needed, not into the large multinationals, but into the growth areas. And let me come back to where we were right at the beginning talking about those technology stocks which need investment to try and make them grow because our technology stocks start off as seedlings, grow into nice little saplings, and they get promptly bought uh, by our cousins in America or in the continent. Um, and so we miss out on that and lose that. So regionally is just merely a piece of financial planning, putting that back to enable regional investors, national investors, international investors, bypass London and go directly to those centers to look at those growth businesses and the key issue for me is making sure you're doing the due diligence to make sure you've got quality businesses in there. Actually, as you were saying earlier, the right standards, make sure that they're operating in the right way and the investors are investing in something they can understand and what they're being told is truthful. There'll no doubt be some which won't, uh, won't live up to their reputation, um, but actually we can stop an awful lot of the bad ones coming through. So, so far, touch wood, uh, with a, it seems to be going heading in the right direction. Um, the investors like it, companies like it, and the local advisors, and even the politicians like it. Well, why wouldn't they? It doesn't cost them anything. Congratulations for doing that. Thank you. Uh, wish you all the very best. Now, I've got a few questions that came in advance. There's a few questions in the chat box. So let's uh, switch over to the, for those. And I'm trying to group them together. So uh, the demise of the high street uh, and retail due to COVID, is it overdone or will it have to reinvent itself? And a similar question about offices and their future. Fascinating, isn't it? Uh, the high street isn't finished, it's still going to be there, but we have this view of the high street's always been there. No, it hasn't. Um, it's in many ways a relatively recent uh, dynamic that's come through. Um, but the, the high street changes. Uh, for those who know Britain well, will know actually most British high streets were almost identical. They're, they're, they're the same brand names all over the place. Um, and there was actually very little in terms of local businesses. So the, what you'll have an opportunity now for the local regional councils and such like to encourage smaller local businesses, and particularly also in terms of risk with the pandemic, companies are looking to cut their supply chains much to de-risk them, shorten them a lot. So therefore actually source materials on a localized regional basis, which makes a lot of sense. Um, so what you're gonna see now is the high streets change. You're not going to see so many of those highly leveraged uh, restaurant chains uh, there anymore, quite the same level. Most have gone bust, uh, but they weren't going to go bust just because of the pandemic. They were going to go bust anyway, um, because you had companies like, I'm sure uh, many won't know them, but uh, Jamie Oliver, Italia, um, and Carluccio's. These were financed by private equity uh, who had passing the parcel around to each other as they kept on selling it on with more debt and more debt. And we were heading for a significant slowdown in the economy, which meant those companies were going to go bust anyway. For a lot of those ones which have gone bust subsequent to that as a result of the pandemic, it was merely bringing forward uh, those which were going to die anyway. Uh, sadly, this is uh, the bloody corporate savannah, but from those uh, corpses will arise then the next stage mixing metaphors here, I do apologize, of uh, Phoenix companies coming out of it, good quality assets, um, which will actually then free themselves of the debt and start off on the next stage. So the high street changes from what it is now, and good local councils will realize that they can do a lot to encourage that with more pop-up shops and developments. What you're going to find also though, is there'll be more use of the big shopping centers, the shopping malls, because it's much easier to control people there in a socially acceptable manner or a healthy manner, uh, and so there'll be more focus on that. The question on offices is going to be interesting as well, because you know, so much investment's been put into city developments and city offices. And if you go, whether it's City of London or whether you go to Canary Wharf, it's silent. It really is silent. Um, you can't even say it looks like that on the weekend. Well, no, worse than that, because there are only tourists. Um, and underneath Canary Wharf, there are two big shopping centres there. The last time I was there, uh, it was round about uh, a quarter of the businesses are shut. I'm now told it's now over 30% of the businesses are shut. Um, and so, you know, that uh, is a, a measure. But those are the shops and things like that. What you're going to find now is a lot of those companies now adjusting their uh, footfall. They don't need such big offices anymore. So therefore, they've now got the technology to allow people to work from home. They still want people to come in because you need to manage people. And for that, you still need face-to-face -face contact, um, in my view anyway, if you're building teams up properly. 
but it does change. So there's going to be an awful lot of extra property space available. So watch out. There are going to be some interesting shaped uh, sort of uh, condominium units in the city of London available quite soon uh, up for sale, which will look remarkably like old city offices. Um, and uh, so that's going to be changing. No, city property market has already started changing dramatically. Um, and you can see actually how a lot of that has changed with demand for uh, regional property in the regional centres uh, outside London, where people don't feel they have to go into the city anymore. Actually, we can do it locally. The cost of doing so is now much cheaper indeed. Um, and companies have been able to just force them to get through decisions they would otherwise have found very difficult to make. Um, and uh, so the, the good ones are using it to their advantage. OK, no, that's great. And we saw a shopping centre change hands, didn't we, last week for something ridiculous or about 10 percent of its value uh, three years ago, I think. Yeah, and it is it, you know, the, if you just look at the, uh, the, the basics of the economies of those businesses, it's you know, shops there paying rent. Well, if they can't actually get they haven't got a business coming through, um, they can't pay the rent. Uh, meanwhile, those large corporations got big investments into these things, the infrastructure, everything goes with it. Um, and uh, so, yes, the, the assets now have just completely devalued. On the other hand, here's an opportunity of picking up assets which are very cheap indeed. Mm -hmm. So it, there are some very interesting things to look around at, at the moment. Um, uh, but be wary, uh, because the fact that it actually is cheap does not necessarily mean it's good. I'm looking, looking for those businesses which are now going to be coming out the other side of this. Their competitors have gone not all of them, a number of them, but they find themselves in the possession where they've refinanced themselves, restructured. One example of a large company that's done that, whether you like the way they've done it or not, that's IAG, the International Airlines Group, which is, you and me, is British Airways and Iberia uh, and Air Fungus, uh, Fingers, uh, Lingus. Um, and um, so all of that has meant that uh, they took this as an opportunity to renegotiate, renegotiate the cabin staff salaries. No, they didn't, they just cut them renegotiate the pilots packages and cut them too. Uh, adjust the planes to get rid of the old ones, bring in more cost-effective ones, and by the way, do better deals with leasing companies. And they went through a huge change like that. They're still racking up losses, but they're in the position to be a really cost-effective business. When we come out of this, and uh, who's lost out on it? Well, those companies that have gone bust, those other airlines bust, and there are quite a number of them, probably some more to go. Okay, now I'm gonna to turn to the chat box. Um... Quick one from uh, Mark Quigley. Uh, what do you think of CBX? Never heard of it myself. Selling, selling a goods PLC. It was an IPO at 5p on Friday, opened at 29, 5p, and closed at 13.5p, one of the many cannabis related stocks that clearly you follow for your Daily Mail readers. <laughs> I mean, you know, whether you like it or not, it's not so much that everyone should be going off and rolling up. Uh, but actually, in terms of the, this industry, it is developing very significantly. Now, I don't mean necessarily just, just flogging, uh, flogging dope. Actually, in terms of the medical elements of it, uh, in terms of providing the facilities uh, to be able to manage it, um, and all the other business-related elements coming from it, certainly the digital side of it. Um, so it's well worth looking at, because you can see the, um, the opportunities in terms of where the business grows. But... The valuations you've seen with some of these businesses have just gone through the roof. And uh, you can come up with all sorts of uh, drug related puns, I'm sure, on that. But the whole point of it is that, you know, that uh, yes, there's, a, there's some good businesses there, but I'd be very wary at the moment of actually looking at some of those valuations. I think I'll wait for that fashion fad to actually pass. There are going to be some tank tops there. And as uh, you well know, I own many tank tops. <laughs> There's a question from one of our friends in the NHS that I work with saying that yeah. uh, the EU's accounts have never ever been signed off. No one's actually got to the bottom of that, which was one of the reasons for, for Brexit. And the NHS have, have been hamstring for going out to pit tenders and pitches because of Brussels rules. Um, is that true? Yeah, you're quite right. Uh, Brussels has never actually had its uh, accounts signed off. Uh, and fully audited. And that's one of the issues that Schäuble, the German finance minister, was so angry about. Now, here you are having running something which is not properly accountable um, and in terms not properly running in terms of accounting. Um, so therefore, this is an inefficient way of working. You can imagine your average German dislikes that intensely. The French, on the other hand, were very happy for it to go on. Um, so that comes back to that frustration again. And this increasingly will uh, grow amongst those countries in, uh, in Europe who are the ones putting money in and they don't feel they're getting the right deal in terms of those that are taking money out of it again. Um, and in my view, the EU has grown too fast 
and it doesn't have the requisite controls in place to do this, and particularly if you're then imposing a single currency on it as well. Um, and I'm afraid that's going to cause more problems. That doesn't mean necessarily avoid the companies themselves. You know, the companies will be, you know, there's some sort of excellent businesses there um, and uh, certainly focus on that. But I'm afraid politically, Europe, I think, is going to find itself being sidelined unless it can replace Merck with a group of, a new group of leadership, which is actually seen to be more inspirational uh, than the, the grey faces of Brussels. OK, next question. The New York Times says anyone who's anyone has a SPAC right now. What's that about? A SPAC, a SPAC or SPAV, Special Purpose Acquisition Vehicle or Company. Um, yeah. And it goes back to that point I was making about the uh, South Sea bubble. What are they investing in? They're not telling you. They don't know. But what we're going to do is we'll get your money in and we're going to do actually do some deals on it and we'll let you know how we get on. Um, you know, I mean, that really is just asking someone to go and have a punt uh, on with your money. Be very careful indeed. Um, you only have to look at you know, how difficult it is for private equity businesses to make money. Uh, and they spend their entire time looking at businesses which they can then um, lay up with debt, or make them more efficient in terms of their balance sheet, which is laid them up with debt, um, and then pass it on in three years on to the next private equity firm. No, this is not a recipe for guaranteed returns. The concept of a SPAC or a SPAB is very good. Here is a pile of money. I can go around and I go and pick up assets from all those injured creatures on the savannah. Uh, they're the ones that benefit from. So everybody's very keen on these at the moment, but until you can actually tell me what they're investing in, I would keep very well clear of them indeed, Absolutely. because otherwise you're just giving free reign to any of those fund managers. Trust me, I'm a fund manager. Your name's not Woodford, is it? Um, in which case the answer is no, I don't. That sounded like Woodford, didn't it? Again, um, yeah. So the mm. place to go is somewhere like Seven Investment Management or our old <laughs> colleague in Barclays, um, Terry Smith. He, he's, he Terry goes, Smith? He goes for safety, doesn't well, he? I know I've got a couple of fans. Terry's there. very good. He was the bank manager of Fleet Street branch. Um, and, uh, you know, he was, and he made his name in, but when they set up, remember BZW, what a disaster that was at Big Bang. Um, and he was a banking analyst, a very good banking analyst. And what Barclays have never realized is if you employ a banking analyst, they also review your own company as well. And they were astonished when Terry Smith turned around and put Barclays down as a sell. And they were absolutely, that, hang on, we employ this person. He's telling them to actually put our shares down. And of course, they couldn't get their hand around that at all. And so quite, it was only a matter of time before he left. Now, his concept of investing is very straightforward. He generally, there are some exceptions to this. He goes for a relatively small number of uh, good quality, liquid businesses um, and will only run his funds up to a certain scale because otherwise they get too big, they get very unwieldy. You then find you can't sell the stock um, you, and you find yourself actually being often being the main market in the stock, which is not a good position for a fund manager to be in as Woodford found. But in his case, he was coming up doing the nefarious things with a, an old colleague of his at the Invesco effectively cornering the market. Um, and uh, so that was bad investment. Unfortunately, our compliance regulators took no notice of it at all. They say at the moment, no one told us about it. That's not true. They were told, they were warned, they ignored. That's extraordinary, isn't it? Last question for you from my friend, Mike Roberts down in Cornwall. I think he wants uh, UDI for Cornwall as well, but uh, he wants to know, is there, a, is there a future for Cornish mining, metal, geothermal and lithium? Yeah, well, actually, the lithium's the one. Um, uh, everyone's talked about uh, you know, mining for tin in Cornwall ever since the Romans were here. Um, and every 10 years, someone says, I found another line of tin, and off we go, and more money is pour, uh, poured down a black hole. Um, actually, in terms of lithium, there are some very interesting issues there. And of course, demand for lithium in terms of battery um, uh, requirements and such like, it's one of those key needs. So if there is, uh, a proper seam of uh, structure there, which can uh, uh, justify the cost of mining, um, then it may well be uh, may well be sensible. For private investors, be very wary indeed, because um, you know quite often mining, you have no idea actually what's going under there. You'll have a geological report, but they won't know until they're actually in the thing and you really understand the quality of it. So yes, um, actually there's still, you've got the Camborne School of Mines down there, which by its very nature, it actually uh, encourages more people to understand about mining, not just in Cornwall, but all around the world. So there's actually a cradle of knowledge. Cornwall's interesting because um, although it's one of the poorest areas of Europe, um, 
because it was so poor, it attracted an awful lot of EU uh, money to invest in it, which is why they voted to leave, for some strange reason. Um, and so they put in ultra high speed internet into Cornwall. And it's had a huge impact on some of the small development parks and the high tech parks there, precisely for the reason I was saying earlier, like you know, Silicon Roundabout and things like that. They bred because they had high quality communications. Um, and so people weren't uh, in a position where they couldn't go elsewhere because you know, in Cornwall, in terms of train rides, you're a long way away from anywhere. Um, they didn't need to. They could actually develop it here locally. Uh, but the speed of technology in terms of being able to uh, communicate and get uh, elements moved around has just made such a difference for them. Uh, and I've been blown away by some of the businesses based in Hale, which is actually quite, which is the sort of the not less attractive part of opposite St. Ives. Um, and some amazing businesses there, which is the last thing you expect to find in Cornwall. Um, and so I actually think there's a, a great opportunity there in Cornwall. It needs more capital. And in fact, one of the first companies through regionally uh, is actually, uh, again, it's going to be down in Cornwall, uh, focusing on some software there, but also in terms of uh, uh, finance. So there's a lot going on there, but they're a classic case where they more need more direct capital coming in, not government grants. They obviously don't want to get EU grants anymore, um, but uh, that will actually have an opportunity of making that a much more dynamic area uh, than it's been for donkey's years. Fantastic, Justin. Well, we're almost at the end of the uh, end of the session, so uh, thanks for joining me. Will you stay on afterwards and just answer a few informal yeah, questions? Yeah, cool. That's the first. Yeah, thing. delighted. Second thing is, will you come back and join us? And um, shortly, it might be even more shortly if your forecast for Wednesday uh, don't go right. And uh, thirdly, clearly Boris has got uh, Cornwall in his heart because the uh, the actual G7 summit is just between Hale that you mentioned and St Ives at uh, Carbis Bay. So that will be interesting. I want to know how the um, how the cars will get down those country roads, but we'll find that. I out. mean, the Carbis. The Carbis Bay Hotel is also tiny. You know, it's just as well as doing the G7 because they've that's the number of rooms they've got. I know. Um, I and of all the places in the whole of Britain you could have chosen, you know, that was possibly the least <laughs> appealing to actually get to. Anyway, no matter. Well, I've cancelled my holiday for Cornwall in uh, in June, even if I thought I was going to allow to be, to get down there anyway. Uh, Justin Eckhart Stewart, thanks for joining me. Thanks for joining me, everybody, on uh, YouTube on the Negotiators Podcast. It's lovely to see you. And every Monday night, uh, Derek's Monday Night Live show. Do join us, and we look forward to seeing you again, Justin. Have a great week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. Good luck. Everybody.